uh, then at least certain parts of the internet are very rapidly changing. Think about the debate on internet governance at the incredible acceleration of the, of the recent months. And again, the timing, the pace of academia is not uh, the same. So it presents a specific challenge. You want to address something that is changing as you try to study it. On the other hand, if you manage to keep the pace, you also have an opportunity potentially to shape the course of events, perhaps. And also, another specific challenge of the internet is that in many cases, including internet governance, what you need is interdisciplinary research, which is something that is often uh, uploaded and uh, recommended, but uh, it's difficult to do proper interdisciplinary research. It's difficult. And secondly, at least in certain systems, and certainly the Italian system, there is a clear disincentive again in doing interdisciplinary research. In recent years, we've become even more disciplinary than we were in the past. So you can see if in general you can have a choice, broadly speaking, in trying to, in trying to decide, at least as an individual, what kind of academic, what kind of professor, what kind of researcher you are in relationship to society, and you have to develop a pretty articulated sets of deontological guidelines in doing so. Uh, if you want to do that, be in specifically involved and address internet issues, you have this other set of potential uh, obstacles to overcome. Having said that, I, and that's the reason why I'm on this stage, of course, and I give my hand in also in organizing the event, I do think, even though it's difficult, so assuming we want to deal we want to have a more active, more proactive role with society, and assuming we want to deal with the internet issues, I think it's very important as academics that we do it. Why? For several reasons. The first, first one is that uh, the internet now has a, uh, is already clear, and it will be even more clear in the, in the coming years, is that has enormous social importance, meaning economic importance, political importance, cultural importance, so it's, one of the, it's not the issue because there are many other important uh, and fundamental issues in front of us uh, in the next 20 years, but it's definitely one of the issues. And so can, can we as academics uh, say, well, that's, you know, it's complicated, uh, it's too fastly evolving, it's too difficult, no, I'm not interested? Perhaps uh, you can say that, but my point of view is that we cannot uh, let this fundamental issue go without uh, academia playing a role. Secondly, it's very contingent. We are, we are, I believe, but I look forward to hearing what you, what you think during the question and answer session that will follow shortly after this panel. I believe that we are in, in a still fluid situation. We are not starting from scratch. Already there are path dependencies and huge institutions already working, but we are still in a fairly fluid phase regarding several aspects of the internet. And so, the time, the opportunity to have an impact as researchers is now. Five years from now could be too late. And uh, there are historical precedents. And uh, for instance, uh, I always find fascinating the parallels between uh, the, the time we're living now and the early 20s when the radio was being defined. Uh, if you read some of the discussions in the US uh, when the, the Radio Act of 1927 was being discussed, it's surprising how similar it sounds to the discussion about the internet. It was very clear to the, to the Congress in the US that uh, the regulation of radio, the creation of the Federal Communications Commission was going to have an impact, not only an economic impact, but also an impact on democracy. It's very plain in their discussions, and it's true. We are still dealing with the Federal Communications Commission, and we are still dealing with the framework created in 1927 in the US, and with many differences in other countries. So I think we are still in a pre-27 situation, where the situation is still somewhat fluid, so now is the time to do have an impact. And finally, uh, the internet is ours. In what sense? Well, of course, the internet now belongs to three billion people, and soon it will belong to the all almost all the citizens of, of the world, but the internet was, is a brainchild of uh, academia. It was conceived by researchers. It was shaped by the research ethos uh, of academics. We were involved uh, for decades, in the, not only in the running from the technical point of view, but in the shaping of the institution. And many of the organizations that are currently running the internet, at least parts of the internet, uh, have still these connections uh, with the university world. 
As Stefano Quintarelli said uh, this morning, uh, the ethos of academia meant that if you wanted to start something email, it was obvious that it was going to be distributed and not a central platform email.com because that was the ethos of academia in the 70s and forward. Uh, so what happened? It looks like that at least part of academia thought, well, now the internet is mature, is up to for commercial exploitation, and we don't have to play a role anymore. We have a, our own business to run. And, uh, and that's probably was wrong or is wrong. We have an opportunity to remind that uh, the internet is it, what it is precisely because it was shaped by an academic ethos. And that ethos is what made the internet different from other communications network. So that's a, yet another reason why academia, uh, university professors, researchers, uh, uh, and others in our world uh, have a, uh, should have a motivation to be involved in this uh, internet governance and more broadly in internet issues studies. Thank you. I would like to thank both uh, our speakers because in a very um, surprising way we did discuss a little bit the inputs that we were going to give during the panel but not the specific contents and I found that there was like a, a an only line, a unique line of thought that was joining together our three um, inputs, like, and especially um, theirs. Um, I don't know how to proceed now because I, I would really like to uh, leave the floor for the question and answer. I just maybe conclude saying what to me are the key words that emerge from um, the inputs provided by our speakers. So the first one is, um, definite responsibility, because as academics we act with a high responsibility of taking part of, of the internet governance and in deploying the internet governance. The second um, word that I th thought of is legitimization. What legitimizes us as academic to actually become active part and contributors and watchdog uh, inside the process of internet governance. And the third is implementation. Because what we do most of the time is being academics also when we participate within global forums or when we do this capacity building programs. But then, it's, so we help elaborating plans. But then somehow we're still a step behind participating to the full implementation of the very good things that we suggest all the time. And so on this, Three keywords, I really leave the floor open for discussion on what has been said now on the stage and on all the issue that we have discussed this morning. So feel free to participate, but we will move this downstairs, right? Okay. First of all, thank you, Elena, for moderating this session. And now, actually, what we're going to do is uh, to step down from this very hierarchical structured uh, space. And together with my good friend Urs Gasser, we're going to come down right there and try to have a very open form, a free session regarding what we discussed during the whole day. It's a wonderful opportunity to listen to your voice and not only two hours. Let me go down. All right, so thank you very much. While you're walking down, um, Juan Carlos, I have a question for you to kick uh, things off, and that is, I think in both presentations, uh, we've heard the role of time, the essence of time, right? Jin Maie was describing the situation where she had to catch up uh, in a very short period of time uh, to participate in, a, in an important policy event. And you, Juan Carlos, you also pointed out um, the challenge, of course, that we have to synchronize um, uh, the fast-paced environment in which we live, where decisions are made by big companies, of course, overnight. That may be game changers by policymakers um, who travel around the world, it seems. We've seen it this morning uh, on this chart. Um, uh, and we as academics, yeah, should, should somehow find the time to uh, reflect, do research, be thoughtful, translate the research, make it accessible and the like. Uh, all real time uh, in order to be effective. And so I was wondering um, whether you can 
expand a bit on this question on, and Jinmai as well of, of time and how we as academics um, deal with, with this challenge and as to what extent, that's a thing you, you didn't mention, the internet who's not only been invented by academics and not only academics shaping the internet but of course the internet changing how we as academic academics work and may participate. So in other words, does the internet help us with the timing issue or is it just accelerating the whole thing and we're totally lost? What are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, um, both, I guess. Being in the po policy space, of course, means a lot more knee-jerk responses than one is always comfortable with as an academic, and that's something that I struggle with really often. Um, but also, I have to say that once when I was asked for government inputs um, over a long series of subjects, I needed to recruit three former students to help me with the research since they were the ones that had done internet governance with me. And so the team that worked on this was actually spread across three cities and we worked together using the internet. And this involved discussion and actual research, so I think that it's had its very substantial benefits. And the other part is something that I guess that we'd have to work out for ourselves, how, how far we want to be knee jerk and, um, and kind of allow time to shackle what we will do um, versus how far we say that, sorry, we're not policy people, we're academics. Thank you. Juan Carlos, you want to add to that? Just very quickly the, on the fact that the, uh, the real prerequisite in order to address this fast-changing space is actually to have a, a substantial degree of autonomy. Autonomy means uh, uh, you're free to use your time and your resources uh, quite freely. And uh, so it becomes pretty much an institutional issue, meaning how free are you, are you to set your agenda, are free to change your, your commitments, uh, and uh, in this space, we really go into the discussion about the university in the sense that I have tenure and uh, I'm using that also to do some of the stuff we're doing because I can, and actually I think one, one of the historical reasons, especially in the US for tenure was precisely that, to free you in order to be able to address also controversial, complicated issues in, also in a timely manner. And, and resources is obvious, is also another prerequisite. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Where, where is Malavika? She's not here. She left, okay. Um, so Jeff, you're, you're prepared for a cold call. So you're, you're, you recently you know, um, uh, wrote the PhD thesis. And, and so listening to this conversation about um, uh, the challenges we have on the one hand side as academics, especially as young academics, right? Uh, yes, you have to write your dissertation, you have to worry about jobs and trajectories and the like. But at the same time, as we also heard um, uh, during the panel, internet governance in particular, you're focusing on other things or specific issues, I should say, such as um, privacy as one governance issue. Um, these are exciting topics, especially for young people. You've also mentioned it, Jin Mai, that students love to work on internet governance stuff. So how, how, what are your experiences like navigating the space, your personal interests, uh, becoming an academic, contributing to all these uh, complex debates, but at the same time also having to, of course, navigate um, uh, the field and, and get a degree and, and be a lawyer and, you know, at the same time working interdisciplinary. Can you share a, a few thoughts and general reflections on, on what, you've, what you've heard? Uh, that's a very tough question. Um, I think for me personally the, the main issue is to, to be able to focus because in this space there's so many interesting stuff going on. And uh, especially in the internal governance uh, debate, it's so broad and it covers, it's sort of a horizontal uh, discussion. Uh, and um, I think the, the added value of academics is to, 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 to provide in-depth research in specific topics. Uh, and, 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 and personally, my career, very early career, uh, I'm struggling to really focus. Uh, to find, to find focus in, in, in this space. And just a follow-up question, is there anything that, 
we're a network of centers, right? We have many leaders here from, net, uh, from centers. Is there anything that centers can do for young researchers to open up spaces so that it makes your life easier to focus? Or we have some echo somewhere, yeah. You have to think about that. Anyone else? Yeah, from HIG, yes, coming. I have slippery shoes, so I have to be careful. Thank you. Um, I'm Osvaldo Saldias from the HIG, the Humboldt Institute in Berlin. If I may, I would like to step back from the actorness dimension that the ah, conversation like is, that. Yeah, and get go to the um, epistemic dimension of uh, the academic role in um, being coming myself from the field of uh, comparative law and politics. Um, I was wondering and thinking during the first and the second panel from this design top down and bottom up that especially in the second panel top uh, bottom up that the cultural and the contextual um, dimension and factor was uh, mentioned and addressed by Wolfgang by Daniel C context is important so I was thinking and putting myself in the position of those who will be drafting the synthesis as we, of these case studies. Um, how do we deal in our commitment to theory building? Because that's what the glue that binds us together as an epistemic community, knowledge creation. When we um, are synth in, in the task of uh, making a synthesis of the case studies that are culturally so different, how are we going to deal with context and culture? And my two options, alternatives are, when we are learning about India, the Enquete commis Commission, Israel, one, one possibility is we ask the experts to reflect on the cultural dimension within their research, like Janet Hoffman did, explaining what the Enquete Commission does, or, uh, or we abstract of the cultural differences in internet process, internet governance processes, in order to reduce complexity of this phenomena. And when the, those who are making the synthesis, they just distill, how you say, they distill the lessons without respect to context, this would be easier. But the problem is, who is going to address the contextual factors? Are these people who are going to reflect upon differences, are these going to be people, scholars, committed to, with comparison, with cultures? Because we are not doing it. So I would provoke, want to provoke a little bit and claim for the introduction of a new, of an expanded disciplinary epistemic function, which is the comparative internet scholar. Um, this is provocative. How are we going to deal with the differences? Um, this is a question to those who are going to draft the synthesis. I have no clue. Thank you, that's a great provocation. Uh, I would be happy to comment on, on the case studies and how we plan to do the synthesis. But I think you're asking a broader question and I would like to stay in the broader theme for, for the time being um, because we're still kind of um, uh, reflecting on, on the last panel uh, before we then can totally open up and talk about uh, anything that comes to mind. Um, but I want to actually bring in Rob uh, uh, and have your reflections as the research director of the Birkin Center, someone who has done extensive comparative work um, uh, and thinking a lot about these methodological issues. How do we do that? Yeah, not in the context of the case studies here necessarily, but in general, is there uh, this comparatist internet legal studies or internet studies scholar emerging, or are we just at the beginning of that? What are your thoughts? Uh, thank you for the out, so I can say yes, we're at the beginning of it. <laughs> it would be the starting point. I, I think in general, comparative work is very, very difficult. Um, I, I started out my career as an anthropologist where every detail was essential and you couldn't tell the story unless you told the whole story. Um, I then switched to the other side of the pendulum and spent time as an economist where 
we tried to reduce the world into that one variable that was really we wanted to understand this one thing. And I think we're trying to span somewhere between those two areas. And in almost every respect, when we're studying these very, very complex um, situations across different countries, we have many, many more variables than we have observations. And I think that weds us, I think, in the short term to really focus on case studies and understanding what we know about a given context at a given time. And then, of course, the, the great challenge there is trying to excerpt from there to extrapolate from that into, into wider, more comparative things. And I think that's the direction that we're going, and uh, it's great to see that. I think we are at the beginning, as you, as you say. Thank you. And just as a footnote, one way to think about it is what you extract from the case studies uh, can be seen as working hypotheses or can be seen as uh, initial observations that, that can be improved or validated over time. So I think we also have to move away from there is this one publication that forever will tell the truth about X or Y. No, this is a learning process. Uh, and, and we also have to create, I think, new ways to present our, our research, to put it back into context and, and also use technology to update and, and add and expand uh, on our findings as we know better, maybe in a month or a year from now, and hopefully we know better, yeah. Over to you, Juan Carlos. Actually, there was, do you want to, to intervene? Yes, I, um, I'm Paul Fenninger from the Internet and Jurisdiction Project and um, I wanted to, to, to add something or stress one dimension that I did not hear sufficiently um, being stressed during the panel discussions on the role of academia in the Internet governance ecosystem, which is the role of academia in evidence-based policy processes. This is something that we are trying to do in the Internet and Jurisdiction Process that we integrate through the Internet and Jurisdiction Observatory experts from around the world, basically, to inform the participants of the ongoing policy process about emerging trends, about high-level patterns. And I think this role of academia is not only limited to the mapping on a meta level, which is very relevant, and the transfer of knowledge, um, education being a neutral venue for deliberation, all of these things are incredibly valuable and, and important. But I think um, there's an active role for academia to play in, in, in the creation of distributed governance systems, which is providing the basis for having an evidence-based um, um, deliberation and policy process and therefore enable better policies and, and uh, innovation in this um, space. Thank you. And the Internet and Jurisdiction Project clearly um, creates a template and thinks also strategically about how to collect that data that then can um, serve as an evidence base uh, for policy making. So this is a great case study in, in, uh, in that respect. If you're not familiar with the project, I encourage you uh, to check it out. Bill, you had a response to, to that evidence-based policy making or a separate threat. Anyone who'd like to follow up on the evidence-based policy making? Stefan, you would like to comment on this particular one? I thought so. I read your mind, you know. I see you typing and I know there is something on your mind. <laughs> no, I think, it's, uh, I think a, a critical element is going to be exactly to, uh, um, um, to f from an academic point of view, to, f to start finding out what works under what conditions and for what purposes, uh, which could be, anyway, what you call evidence-based uh, 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 policy making. Uh, and I think uh, um, what a, t a kind, so we had different meaning, of course, academia has many methodologies. We have comparative methodologies. We have different kinds of methodologies. But one kind of methodology that we have to start applying more and more in order to get to the evidence is really uh, so-called action research or experimental kind of research is that you actually, anyway, go, go in, do stuff, learn and do and learn and do. And, and that kind of... Uh, more action research kind of focus uh, is really what ne what is needed in this space, which ha till date has been less prominent because till date most of the academics that are working on internet governance uh, are coming from the policy and legal uh, 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 perspective quite often, uh, um, or I mean, because it's governance, uh, uh, and so that automatically means that the methodologies uh, are quite often anyway limited to, to, the, to the discipline 
uh, that the, uh, uh, um, uh, the legal scholarship uh, uh, brings to bear, which, by the way, can be varied, meaning having been <laughs> a fellow in social legal studies, uh, know that there are a variety of methodologies there as well. But I think experimental research is, uh, is highly needed to bring the evidence that, uh, that uh, uh, we have here. If I can make a, a quick um, comment, uh, of course, uh, as a researcher, I cannot be, have anything but good words for evidence-based uh, and data collection and so on, because that's what we do uh, for, for our profession does. But at the same time, there is a, such a strong evidence, uh, actually maybe across history, but also in recent years, that very clear academic evidence is systematically and continuously ignored at the policy level decision, uh, which means that we have to be realistic about the, the power of evidence-based uh, policy making. And I think the, the antidote to that is to a connection to the level of rights. So as I mentioned this morning, we are discussing internal governance, and at the same time there is a broader and broader movement talking about digital rights, which is not based on evidence, it's not scientifically proved, it's normative and argumentative, but it's a, a powerful potential corrective of the simply power dynamics uh, that are happening at the political level, ignoring the evidence base whenever they think it's convenient to be ignored. Wolfgang, do you have a direct follow-up or is it a new threat? Um, All right, then turn over to you. Okay. Um, well, uh, Lorenzo Pupil, um, today I spoke as a telecomitat, now I spoke as a member of GIGANET, because I'm, I have two ads. Um, I think that uh, what is uh, my, the feeling I'm getting from this discussion is that uh, we can sum up saying that to some extent also what uh, Stefano said this morning, looks like uh, the internet, there was like an internet of the golden age that was very good because it was the, the internet of the 90s, because it was uh, basically done by the academics now instead, uh, because there are less academics working on the internet, uh, internet is something uh, not wrong, but definitely different from the past. Um, I think that uh, definitely the internet of the past was, uh, was uh, heavily created by academics, and for this reason had also some problems, like, uh, for instance, didn't have uh, built-in security because there was no need, because it was a close community or just a few thousand, uh, few hundred thousand maybe users. Now, internet is a totally different uh, thing. It's much more uh, uh, um, dynamic and heterogeneous because it's serving three billion uh, uh, customers, all totally different applications, totally different services. Therefore, I think that the uh, today, uh, the academia has an incredible role to try to understand how, how uh, the challenge coming out from today's internet is completely different from the past should be approached. So I think we should not look with nostalgia to the past, but uh, looking forward to the uh, much broader uh, issue that you have. For instance, think about net neutrality. Why we are still have this... Uh, uh, let's put it this way, uh, even, let's say, theology is, a, according to some people, it's a science. The academia can give a, an important role in theology too. But why we need to have a theological approach to internet neutrality, no? Uh, we, have, we know that now there are, uh, the network is different. There are, uh, there are different approach. For instance, one approach can be we need to have uh, we extend the net neutrality to everything from, from platform to search engines and um, other layer of the stack. Or maybe we need a different concept of net neutrality because the uses like the, the zero rate uh, uh, package are offering in, in Africa. For instance, I, was, uh, uh, I invite all of you to, to give you just a flavor, to read this uh, blog from Steve Song is a blog from Africa. It was basically was mentioned the case of uh, zero rate from Facebook or a local story from, um, from um, Google, saying that for us these are not violation neutrality because the most important thing is uh, 
to guarantee competition. The only way to guarantee relief and neutrality of the network is to guarantee competition. So I think there are very challenging uh, uh, questions I had for academia to approach. And I think this is what uh, academia should be today. Maybe since he was referring to what I was saying, just a quick reaction Please. to this. Uh, of course, no nostalgia, otherwise we wouldn't be here, meaning that we were looking forward uh, and trying to understand our role for the future. Uh, maybe I can rephrase uh, also what Stefano Quintarelli was saying, which I totally agree, meaning that uh, when in the early 70s uh, um, researchers were thinking about what became email, they had uh, uh, an approach to the problem which uh, didn't uh, start from how am I going to maximize my profit uh, by this new application, which instead is exactly what's in the mind of many people dividing, thinking about new applications today. So they, they chose an approach that was distributed and collaborative and so on because the original motive was different. Now, we cannot turn black back the clock, we can actually, and I agree with you, the internet of the past was a much smaller, much less secure, and so on and so forth. So let's look forward, but we have to think, uh, how can we contribute to the evolution of the internet, uh, taking in consideration not only, specifically only, the commercial uh, profit-making approach, which has the side effects uh, that we dis were discussing during these years. For instance, an internet based on advertising, which has created an enormous problem of privacy, specifically because it was based on advertising. So I agree with you, let's look forward. We don't have to simply repeat what was done in the 70s and 80s, that's silly. We have to find new ways, and it's, I don't have the answer. I don't know how you managed to do that, but I'm open for discussion and finding ways of doing that. Thank you. So we have Tarek, then Wolfgang, then we move in that direction. Bill, since you've been on stage a lot, I start with people who haven't spoken yet, but I, we will get uh, to you, of course. Thank you, Urs. And um, I have a question uh, that was mentioned this morning uh, in the statement by Professor Janet Hoffman. It's clear that we as an internet community need the academic community more than any time else in order to evolve the ecosystem. And policymakers need to get closer to the academic community and vice versa. As such, it has been evident in the Net Mondial and in the ELFS panel and the overall evolution within uh, the last uh, 12 months, the NTIA announcement and others. How to avoid together uh, to fall on the trap that while working together with the academia, we make sure that the academic community really preserves completely its neutrality, its uh, objectiveness while uh, developing uh, and while coming closer to the policymaker, so that the policymaker does not become selective to whatever he wants to make use uh, of in order to develop his uh, targets forward and to push his agenda uh, forward and neglects the overall picture that maybe is an outcome of an academic uh, study and that's very easy to happen. And from the other side as well, that the academic part uh, I don't want to use the word that Janet used today, manipulates, but tailors solution like some consulting firms do according to the wish or to the, to, to, to the policy make. It's a global responsibility and I don't have the answer. Maybe the answer is by wider inclusion from many parts of the world in order to avoid this to happen, but uh, that's just uh, a question uh, that I know that uh, shouldn't, uh, is, is not, uh, does not have a straightforward answer. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. And I hope, Wolfgang, you can share immediately reflections in response so that we have more of a discussion than a ping-pong of sorts. Thank you. Yeah, I try, because it's an extremely interesting question, and uh, I actually was referring to that, or intended to refer to that. Um, I really see that we are in a kind of transition process in many respects, and one is that uh, governance decisions in this field and other fields become more and more knowledge questions. It's not about this position or that position, it's about finding the right solution, it's about assessing uh, the possible effects of a decision in one direction or another, and so on. And so it's inevitable to some extent that academics come in, and it's tempting for us as academics to do that. And um, it's, first of all, it's a good thing, but on the other hand, it's, uh, as you indicated already, associated with some problems. One is, uh, uh, of course, that uh, the quality ensuring mechanism and a mechanism that uh, 
uh, ensures neutrality that the academic community has to some extent does not function anymore. And uh, that is a serious issue and I think one way to address that is to see that uh, the traditional uh, funding and, and uh, peer review mechanisms that we have in traditional academia, that they are somehow uh, used in this new sphere as well. That means, uh, for example, that we have to, to uh, convince our um, national science foundations that they give money with the normal quality insurance we have in the academia to this kind of transfer, knowledge transfer project as well. Uh, otherwise, there is the risk that the academics do not uh, uh, go in there because uh, uh, of the traditional funding and reputation system of uh, academics, but because they like the influence and say, okay, when uh, it's going in a way I personally find interesting, then I give my expertise and uh, not in another way, or I frame my expertise in a way that supports my, my thinking. So one uh, idea uh, might be to uh, not completely uh, let it uh, be separated from traditional academic sphere, but try to find mechanisms to integrate that. That's not an easy one. We had discussions with the German Science Foundation on that and um, I think it's a course um, we should follow. A second idea, um, um, I can see that there are already things emerging which I would describe as kind of intellectual intermediaries. So that we say not uh, the academics coming directly into the process, but that there are some platforms built especially to inform a governance community, kind of, of permanent think tanks and things like that. And some people here in the room actually work uh, with uh, um, institutions or, or experiments uh, that serve this uh, purpose. Maybe we can more systematically think about that and uh, um, part of this ecosystem might be, for example, these kind of intellectual intermediaries, these what is called knowledge communities, maybe the first step in this direction. So that uh, might be a second idea. Um, that's it for now, but maybe I come up with other ideas or the network will. Thank you. Thank you so much. Stefan, do you want to follow up quickly or add to that? Um, I'm, I'm sure you because this is your field, that's what you're doing, right? Yeah. Among many other things. Well, yes, but a comment I wanted to make also is that for academia to be um, uh, relevant um, and, and add value, I think academia has to start innovating itself as well. And I think what uh, Wolfgang indicated is the kind of innovation that we also need, is that we would, that we anyway, organize academic uh, uh, both production and then dissemination in a different manner that is more dovetailed to actually the needs uh, uh, of uh, uh, a variety of constituencies. It doesn't always have to be the policymaker itself, uh, but there can be other uh, audiences as well. And that also includes the way academics work. I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean I, anyway, and that's again changes from discipline to discipline. Now I'm based at the Department of Engineering, where collaborative. Uh, uh, um, Working is 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 normal, right? I mean, most papers have definitely more than one author. Go to other disciplines, and they still have those individual authorship, which uh, is like, uh, all right, one person knows it all, right? As opposed to having more of collaborative kind of ways of uh, generating knowledge. Uh, uh, and so there is a lot of collaborative platforms right now that can actually jumpstart knowledge creation uh, if you would only have academics. Uh, start collaborating more as opposed to working on their own individual book project that takes years, for instance. And so, so that's the kind of uh, uh, innovation uh, that is needed and uh, would actually be great to also um, innovate, especially working on internet governance, to actually use the internet uh, more for academic purposes as well. Thank you, Stefan. Pablo, you're still ready for... Right. Yes. We'll get. Fabro has been very patient here. Thank you. I'm here near the power. That's why I'm here. Uh, in the case of Brazil with the Marco Civil, uh, we kind of have uh, interesting ad hoc situations where Academy actually started a debate on net neutrality and other things. So when the bill passes, well, uh, we were still influenced in all the project and we are in the policy network. And then I'd like to share here something that happened was a project on mass surveillance, not internet governance. 
but it's about policy windows. Uh, so we were in a table, a close meeting with the guys from uh, security in Rio. So they created a big room with lots of televisions, webcams, and so on to monitor all the city. Traffic to drug lords and things like that. And some big universities say, I would like to launch a platform with lots of academic work so you, know, you can learn about experience and so on. And then that guy uh, from, the, from the city council says, look, I hate these platforms. And the reason is there's lots of works and I have no use for it. I'm not going to stop what I'm doing to read it. And then they said, what if we make uh, better enablers? What if we simplify bullet points, this and that? And I said, I don't care. So I said, I have two situations here and I don't know the, the case. The first one is Microsoft comes to my door, offers me a brilliant software. Uh, they give me everything, including the chair, six months trial. When the trial ends, I don't have the money to pay for that. The things goes away. The second thing is someone emails me, look at this article from Harvard, it's brilliant, I love the idea, and then I don't know how to implement it because I know the idea and I don't have the hands to do it, I don't have the academics with me. And then what we bring to some of it there, it's a crowd thinking of uh, people for policy implementation, not policy formulation or policy agenda, but policy implementation. So what is missing there, and I'd love to hear if there are other cases like that, is eventually there are policy windows and then academics are willing to engage. So in this platform, people would say, I like this idea, and if implemented, I would support it. And then when the government wants to do it, people will have it. We will have a test in the next election, uh, the election Brazil is ending now. Uh, the terms and policy of condition to participate in the platform is, if this policy is ever implemented, I support at least be contacted to implement it. So the question here is, if, do you know any experience of policy implementation where we create networks, large scale, not they call somebody, but large scale where people just group together, if implemented, they will just help. Thank you. Any, any takers for this question? Federico? I just buy it, so it's it's great because uh, we we have a, 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 an experience as Nexus Center uh, of working in the domain of uh, open data in particular, which is of course one of uh, many uh, different streams which are connected somehow to internet governance. And uh, yes, typically we are involved uh, uh, at the level of. Uh, defining the policy, then the more you go toward implementation, the less uh, uh, there are really institutional mechanisms to involve uh, uh, the academia. Yes, um, in certain cases, uh, you still have uh, a coordination table which is supervising a, a, a project, but uh, uh, it would be great to think about uh, mechanisms to have some of these projects, which in the case of open data, by the way, are typically in any case, the side project, they are not really mission critical, still they could have a, a huge potential in terms of uh, involvement of uh, citizen and in innovation within the institution. Uh, and so uh, I, I would love to, to discuss more about this uh, approach. Thank you. Bill, you want to weigh in? Sure. Um, the, uh, the question of uh, what role academia or academics could play is for me a challenging one to get my head around because some of us have been very deeply involved in this stuff for a long time. Yeah, so for example, um, I in ICANN chair the non-commercial users constituency which has 360 members, and about three dozen of them are academics, some of them are in this room, uh, who have been involved in policy making for a decade or more, writing proposals that have actually gone into policy processes. Some of us have been directly involved in things like creating the IGF, um, <laughs> and so on. So it is possible for academics to engage directly in policy advocacy work in a collaborative global setting, and I can name dozens of academics who do it um, and have been doing it for a long time. Now, there are problems of incentives there because 
you get both academic, you know, academic colleagues and uh, review mechanisms that don't look well upon politically engaged policy advocacy type work, and you also get uh, people sometimes that you have to interact with in those policy environments who say, well, but you're not being an objective, neutral academic. I, I'm not sure that academics necessarily have to be objective and neutral, depending on if they're clear about what they're doing. I think advocating for human rights and freedom of expression and things like that are not necessarily bad things, and one can do that. Um, so, I, and I think there is a role for direct engagement, number one. Number two, capacity building is something that I think academics have been involved in for a long time. After the Working Group on Internet Governance 10 years ago, um, some of us who were on the WIGIG decided that we needed to do something. We created the GIGANET, which has a global internet governance academic network, which has grown now to hundreds of members around the world. And that has created a space where academics in a lot of developing countries and transitional countries and so on, who otherwise didn't have the possibility to connect with colleagues from around the world and get visibility on a global stage, are now coming to an annual conference held in conjunction with the IGF, as well as workshops and so on. That's building their capacity within their own local market and their visibility and connecting them to colleagues around the world. We also launched after the, the WIGIG uh, the summer schools in internet governance, which have been running now for 10 years in Europe and six years in Latin America, um, run heavily by academics, where we've had hundreds of people coming through who are working in government institutions, uh, as well as the uh, private sector, ICANN staff, um, academics, et cetera. So, I mean, I think there are concrete ways academics can engage in these spaces. Um, it's not uh, especially mysterious, but it is something that poses some challenges of balancing. How do you balance the incentives and constraints that are imposed by your home institutional work environment and what gets rewarded and what does not? And how do you manage to devote sufficient time to be engaged and be constructive? But people do it and it can be done. And I think the network of centers is a new initiative that can foster that further um, and bring, by bringing in new people who are not involved in the existing spaces um, and uh, developing a sort of a space that cultivates new talent and encourages people to get engaged and think about policy relevant questions as well as questions of a purely analytical or theoretical nature. So these are all things that can be done and, and they're being done and we should keep doing them. Thank you for sharing your rich experience but also for the encouragement. Um, um, just on the network of centers, I think what we try to do is obviously complementary and building up on the great work that you and many others have been leading um, and add an institutional component to it because I do think um, in terms of scalability and impact and research capacity, uh, there is an argument to be made that we can move if we work even closer together also at the institutional level that we can take it to the next level, yeah. And that's kind of the attempt uh, that I think is absolutely consistent with, with the mode of engagements and the spirit as you described it. I think Andrea um, is lined up for a question and then Maite. Thank you. Let me stand up. So my name is Andrea Beccali, I work for ICANN. I have a, just some thoughts. Isn't one of the role of the academia to not only create knowledge but also distribute knowledge at a massive level, right? And I think that, I mean, that's what basically Bill was saying at the end. That's a big challenge that academia has in the field of internet governance. Just to make a stupid example, during the lunch break, I took a walk around the patio here of the university and I pretend to feel myself younger than what I am actually and I was looking at the students down there and everybody was holding a mobile phone and using the internet and then I was wondering why these students, they do not come massively to these events. Why they don't see that um, here is the future that they're actually participating but not really shaping. And I think that's a big gap that uh, academia has to, um, I think it's really, it's, in, it's, it's, a, it's a question of its own DNA kind of. 
to create um, netizens or informed citizens that can uh, participate and shape the future of the development of the internet ecosystem. So far, it looks like this ecosystem is really an aquarium because it's really limited. You know, you cannot have an aquarium as the size of the ocean, but uh, the ecosystem of the internet is a little aquarium, but the user is, a, is an ocean. So I think, I don't know if this analogy works, but the, the, our challenge, and um, I would like to hear what do you think about, is actually to bring this knowledge down to the masses in a way, because uh, it's fundamental for, this, for the future development of the internet. I mean, I don't know how many students are in this room right now, but I think really, I mean, this is, a, if you want, a perfect segue, I'm sure, to Maite, who's uh, actually running a platform um, called Public Sphere that, that is working on a similar problem. How do you re-engage young people in, in uh, Euro European politics in particular? But it, maybe you wanted to comment. Just a uh, quick directly. comment, because in this institution at the Polytechnic of Turin, I started three years ago a course called uh, Digital Revolution. Uh, which is, is aimed at first-year students, and actually there are some of my former students here, and uh, it gives them the basic tools to understand what the internet is all about. Uh, so, both technically, very, sim the very fundamental questions, internet governance, internet history, and then how to use proactively the internet. And uh, without those elements, uh, young people poll after poll shows that they have no idea what we're talking about. They have not the faintest idea what ICANN is. They, if you ask them what is a domain name, they have a very vague idea. They use them all the time, but they don't even know how they're named. So I agree with you. It's definitely one of the things that academia should be doing, teaching institutions, also other levels, K-12 or whatever, to, to be teaching the fundamentals of this amazing platform because without the fundamentals, there's no way they will be showing up at a conference like this. Forget about the English, even if it was in Italian, the difference would have been very small. They, they, they need to understand what we're talking about, otherwise for them it's a complete, total, esoteric topic. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd actually like to follow up on, on what you said, but also what you said earlier about um, the role of the university, obviously, in knowledge creation. Um, how, you know, we have so much research still to do, uh, you know, including around subjects such as, you know, how is, democracy, how is the internet changing democracy? But one thing that I would like to bring in is also the issue of participation. Andrea, you touched on it. Um, how is the internet changing participation? And I think um, now going back to what you asked earlier, what can centers do, uh, particularly for young researchers? Um, uh, you know, I've been you know, very involved with this network of centers um, effort for the last two years. At the same time, um, in parallel, I was very involved with um, getting politically interested, generally interested um, uh, young people, but who are not engaged in political processes or parties um, engaged in politics. One thing that we found, for instance, when, when trying to get these young people to whom, <laughs> when I started doing this work, I counted myself as well, um, uh, one thing that we learned is actually that when we, you know, actually when you approach them on the street, one word that you have to avoid is politics. And I was speaking the, the wrong language. I qu quite quickly realized that this couldn't be my job. And I think this kind of goes back to the chain of knowledge, knowledge um, creation, but also of promoting really participation. You and your um, uh, digital revolution course actually have the opportunity to connect with these young academics. Um, and trigger a sort of interest in these issues, but also to create an awareness for the fact that this interest actually relates to, to concrete institutions, to concrete issues that we are talking about in situations like this one. And now linking back to what can centers do, what can the network of centers do, I think one of the great um, one of the great potentials of this network, and um, I think we all know that there's still room for improvement and we're working on it, is that um, also for young researchers, not only, but also for young researchers, um, gatherings like this, 
um, that are fa facilitated by the network actually allow for network building and for an exchange of, of knowledge and um, they surface very particular problems that also you know popped up during several occasions t during today's discussions you know people coming from different disciplinary backgrounds but also from different stakeholder groups from different cultures understanding very different things under the same terms under the same meanings and this requires talking about time time commitment of course a lot of you know recurring possibilities to participate in these kinds of discussions but i do believe that a lot can be won also for the network of centers if we managed to um, make these events themselves more participatory, also going into these events, preparing these events, and uh, also going out of these events in terms of feedback, of making these results uh, available, but also for inviting comments, for instance. And uh, yes, we are already making efforts, uh, but this is also a learning process, but I think that this is something um, that we as a network uh, are already working on, but where there's still a lot of room for improvement and and and, uh, and a particular aspect where I think we can link with young researchers in particular, fostering participation and being open to this in new formats. Thank you, Marita. Stefan again. Stefan again. All the way up. No, no. Well, two things, and, and it comes back to the uh, uh, to the initial uh, question as well, is that I mean, too often we fail to um, uh, connect what happens in academia with what happens in the real world uh, on a real world from a media agenda point of view, and uh, uh, and so two uh, suggestions. One, I established in uh, uh, the Gov Lab uh, uh, what I call um, a uh, it's not happening every day, but it's on a regular basis, uh, editorial board meeting in which every staff, matter, staff member has to join. And we basically have to say, what does our, how does our work relate with, the, with what is being discussed in the news today? And then have this kind of translation discussion so that you at least can talk about the relevance of the work we do in the context of real world happenings. And if you go to the newspaper today, I could come up with five uh, uh, news articles that we could have dissected here on stage and said the work we do is directly relevant to what is happening out there. So that is not happening enough uh, uh, within academia. Second element is I'm an advisor to something called The Conversation. If you don't know, mm -hmm. you may want well to check it out, theconversation.org. It's now available in Australia, uh, UK, and is launching, which I'm not allowed to say, um, I think it's today in the US. Um, and so what they do is basically uh, only connect uh, uh, academics with uh, uh, what's happening in, uh, uh, um, in, in, anyway, in the me on the media agenda. And so they tap into academics, have them write uh, uh, contributions that everyone can read, uh, and they actually have developed a tool to help and edit uh, uh, academics, uh, the, the work of academics, uh, and, and write in, in a meaningful style. Um, and that, there's not, I mean, if you go and look at what the conversation is, uh, 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 is really covering, there's hardly anything on internet governance. And so, I mean, one way to think about it is to connect the network of centers here with actually the conversation and have like an internet governance channel where it, academics uh, contribute to the debate about what's happening at the internet level, and there is really enough <laughs> issues that could be covered there. Yeah. If I may quickly react, uh, you're absolutely right in the sense that academics, uh, particularly in some countries more than other countries, have uh, been talking to each other often in a very highly specialized language uh, and not thinking the word, it was their responsibility also to address the general public. Uh, I do think it's our responsibility. Actually, there is an article in the newspaper today about internet governance that I wrote uh, today in, in the La Stampa, the national newspaper. And um, so uh, we go back to what uh, Bill Drake was saying and also was saying before, it's also a matter of incentives. I know a number of colleagues that maybe they envy that I write on the national newspapers, but at the same time they say, well, it's not academic, uh, it's like... Um, well, the big selling argument of the conversation, which is, by the way, funded by universities mainly in, uh, uh, in Australia, is to be able to show impact. I mean, every university has to start showing impact of the work they do, 
and so by being out there and, and, and be quoted uh, is one way, one metric to show the relevance of, uh, and so there is a big incentive right now to actually start becoming more public. And let me just mention that uh, uh, Andrea and others were talking about participation, but participation, um, the underlying uh, uh, the basis for participation is that you have a sense of what it means to be a citizen. And so that opened the whole topic, which of course we cannot address in 60 seconds, the whole topic of civic education. We also had a meeting at the Perkman Center a couple of years ago on civic education and uh, how young people today and also generally citizens uh, with the decrease of importance of political parties, trade unions, uh, even the military service, the compulsory military service in some kind, they become citizens without ever being exposed to what it means to be a citizen. And so the role of academia over the last 20 years, uh, there is an increased need that academia takes also this task upon itself to also cr help to create citizens. Well, one last comment by Helena. Very briefly, because we're talking about what we could do, and before I said that implementation perhaps is the key. First of all, I would like to say that I teach social movement in my in my department, and is that I don't personally feel like a failure, the fact that I teach social movement and none of my students go in the square and participate, because it takes time, you know, to tr translate the fact that you're teaching a subject into a matter of activism and you know, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, it's education, so education is a very long process, so, not, so that's a response to the comment before. But I think that, for example, there's a network of centers that is uh, a great infrastructure, but it puts together the centers and not necessarily the activities of the center, but the centers are connecting to the teaching, for example, so a way to outreach to the uh, students, for example, could be, I don't know, uh, like a teaching program drafted uh, amongst all the centers together. I don't know if you already do, already do that. Maybe I'm talking about, but um, maybe, I don't know, like a, a set of classes do, uh, or materials drafted by the people in the center from the different point of view, from the different disciplines, and, and enrolling that materials in the teaching activities that each of us is doing. So coordinating ourselves from an activity point of view can be part of an implementation. Absolutely, this is very much on our mind and we are also um, started to experiment with uh, a number of pilots of how to do network teaching in uh, online and offline environments and I think Jin Mai actually was, uh, was very involved in, in one of the early pilots. So this is uh, something we're very excited about and hope to make progress over the next few years. I think we're... Well, I think it's 4.33, so... Thank you. This was uh, an impromptu but fun session. I hope you enjoyed it too. And uh, now the plan is uh, to go again downstairs for a break, but to be back exactly at five sharp for the final keynote speech by Bruce Sterling. Thank you. <laughs>